As we all know, uh, projectors are the hardest technical problem in the world. Uh, so in comparison, this is going to be a very easy talk, so everything's fine. Um, so this talk is about um, shared state and purely functional programming, um, and specifically when a statement and one do. So I'm going to try and explain what all these terms mean, uh, and then um, can I tell you not only how this is done, but also why you should, you should do it uh, this way. Um, so first of all, who am I? My name is Fabio. I'm a principal engineer here at Over Energy, uh, and an open source. An open source uh, author of System of Formiga. I'm a core maintainer of FS2 and Cat Effect and a bunch of other libraries in the purely functional Scala ecosystem. And uh, let's get straight into it. So purely functional programming, um, what, what is this thing? Uh, there's a lot of misconception around about you know, not, not doing side effects, not writing to disk, so how do, you, how do you even do this stuff? So as it turns out, um, most of the problems are with an incorrect definition. So the whole pure fee is based around this, this property called referential transparency, which means you can always replace an expression for its bound value without changing the result. Now this might look a pretty hard thing, but actually something we're all already familiar with from basic math at school. If I tell you that x plus two equals three, and then I tell you that x is four, what you do, you just replace four whenever you see x and then, and then reduce. So all that this is saying is that you wanna be able to do the same thing with your programs. And then we'll see why you might, wanna, uh, you might want this property to hold. So let's, let's, see, look, let's look at some code. Let's apply this, this substitution and see, and see what happens. So the first, the first thing I have there, I just have a, a string that I'm reversing and then I'm appending the string to itself. And the result obviously is holy holy. And to see if preferential transparency holds, I'm just gonna do what I would do with math, right? I'm gonna replace x, whatever I see x, in the bottom definition, and we're gonna see what happens. So, same thing, hello reverse, plus plus hello reverse. As you can see that this is the same result, holy holy. So this is pure, it's referentially transparent, because we did the substitution and everything worked the same. But now, what if I have this side effectful thing, started in dot read int, and I read into an int, and then I sum the two ints. So let's say I, I input two, and then I, I sum it to itself, then it's gonna be four. Okay, so now let's do the same substitution as before, because as we said, we wanna do this substitution to see if our code is purely functional. And obviously it's different, because now I'm gonna do two starter ints, and I'm gonna read two numbers. So the behavior has changed in between, when I replace the thing in, in, in the value, the behavior has changed. So this is not pure, it does not hold, the property does not hold. And then if you've seen future, you might think that, that it's different, but actually it's, it's the same. So, so the map and there is from cats, it's just they combine two things together with, with a function. Um, uh, and then I have the, the val read, which is a future, so it reads like asynchronously. Um, but then when I go and replace it, the same thing happens. This is like a, a side effectful thing, it's gonna start two things. So this is also not pure. So by now, for most people, they associate, well, if I only have additions and stuff like that, 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 that's pure, but if at the moment I start having you know, standard input and, and files, then it becomes impure. It's actually not true. It's just a matter of whether that property is respected, is respected or not. And in fact, if we use cat effect IO, uh, we have um, a program. So the, the way you look at the, that IO is like a little program that is describing an action, and the action is, is, is read from a file. And when you do read read, you're just saying, well, I have two programs, I'm gonna run these two programs and combine the result. Uh, and I can do, I can, re so the, the main difference here, so with future, when you do this, something has already started. And so the property is, is broken, whereas here, nothing is started, that nothing happens when I do var read, it's just a program that doesn't execute anything yet. Uh, and then I can compose programs together to build this, this massive program, which is the whole thing. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the world, I'm gonna say, well, run the resulting program. Uh, and as a consequence of that, the substitution hold. Because it's just a program, I can just replace the uh, definition of the program whenever I see the name, and the result doesn't change. And this is pure. And it's pure by definition, because we have defined purity as this property, referential transparency. Uh, and by the way, some people then say, well, how do you do the opposite behavior where you read once? Well, it's just simple. You say read, map, and then you x, x plus x. So again, you have a program. If you want to run it once, you just mention it once. 
Um, so the, the mindset shifts from, from doing actions to composing programs. And so as a recap, side effects are things that break referential transparency. So that's the definition, nothing more than that. So IO state and, and things like that traditionally are side effects because they break referential transparency, but they don't have to be. If you do them in a referential transparent manner, uh, then they're not, then, then, they're, then they're pure. And, and, and why would you care? So there's a whole other talk just on, on this, but just to give you kind of an idea, because of referential transparency, I can always apply local reasoning. No matter how complicated the, pro the program is, I can always replace things until I have an expression that I can reason about in isolation. And once you have local reasoning, all sorts of awesome things happen. For example, two nice properties that we have is composi con uh, compositionality and composability. So compositionality is the ability to take a complex piece of code, understanding the individual parts of it, and then understanding the complex behavior by putting together the two parts I've understood in isolation. And think about this, when I understand something in isolation, I take a piece, analyze it, and then I'm gonna replace that piece into its definition to see how it works together. Because I know that the behavior is, going, is not going to change, I can do this piece by piece. However, if when you replace things, some things happen, then you cannot, can no longer reason in isolation because there are some effects that are isolated and some that are, you know, kind of, uh, the interaction between, between, between these, these different things. So uh, we're going to talk about a specific facet of this property, just with respect to, to sharing state, but actually it applies across the spectrum. Lack of referential transparency is always lack of compositionality, because you can no longer understand things in isolation without changing the behavior of your program. And also, referential transparency is also known as purity. So I actually don't really like the name purity because you get this sort of moral quality between the pure code and the impure sinful ones. But actually, that, that just, that's it. There's not, nothing more than that. It's a syntactical property which gives you certain semantical properties that you then care about. Okay, so sharing state. First of all, state is actually a very overloaded word. There are several things that we all talk about by saying state, but they're actually very different. First of all, there's local state. And by local state, I mean something that is just um, in the body of a function as a, and as, as a small optimization, but cannot leak out. So the, um, the, 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 the function itself is referentially transparent, but inside the body is not. So a typical example, you have this math function on, on vector, which is called as an immutable data type. You can just implement it by your pattern matching. But let's say for an optimization, I want to do it with a variable, a mutable var there, and, and a, a, you know, an array buffer, like a, kind of like a builder. So this, inside the function, we, we are breaking referential transparency, but outside we're not. It's just, uh, you know, takes a vector, returns another vector. Um, so local state is actually off topic for this talk. I don't care about this. This is fine. Do, do it however you, however you like. It's, it's not really affecting the architecture of your program and your ability to reason at large. What I care about is when you want to share this state. So you have things that you want to share between different parts of the program. That's where most of the complexity hides, not in these like, little, little things. And yeah, from the outside, this function is referentially transparent. I can replace every call to, uh, if I put map into a variable, I can replace every, every occurrence of that variable with map and nothing, nothing's going to change. Okay, so state. If you've had any experience with functional programming, the typical answer when they ask you, oh, how do you do, how do, you do state, is like, oh, the, the state menu. So, or the state data type, to be more precise. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna explain what it is. It's actually fairly simple. Give you an example of why it's nice, and then tell you why actually, in most of, a serv most of the cases in a server-side code base, you cannot use this. It's, it, it's useless. Okay, so we're gonna talk about its limitations. Okay, so state is a data type, just like a, a list or, or an option or whatever. It has two type parameters, S and A, where S represents some, some sort of state, like an integer, and A represents the final result. And the semantics of this data type is that it describes modifications to an S, which then results to an A. So you, you imagine you have an S, you can apply a series of modifications, and at the end of this series of modification, you're gonna have a final result, which is A. And S is an immutable data type. So what, what, this, what this thing is describing is the process of coping, copying a data type, making some changes over you know, a several, several uh, 
transformations. And then once you've described how all these transformations can be done, the way you run this state is just by passing the initial state. So I'm describing how this state needs to evolve, and then when I'm done describing, I'm done composing, I want to actually do it, I just pass the, the, initial, the initial value for the state, and all the transformations are applied. And then it's very, it's very composable. There's a lot of um, kind of APIs that this thing uh, uh, respects. So these are fancy names, but it's just ways of building bigger programs from, from smaller programs. So applicative, we've actually already seen that map n thing that combined, that combined two computation into one with a, with a function. So let's see how, how it's implemented. I only want you to look at the first line for now. So we're saying that state represents a series of modifications on an immutable data type. And, the way we and then we're going to return a result. So the way we can represent this is just with a function that takes the initial state, and then it's going to return a result and a new state. And this function represents the entirety of what you want to do with, with state. So all these other things are just giving you a nicer API to compose these functions together in a way that is nice, nicely uh, from a semantic point of view. Um, then, so imagine we, we, we start with an initial state, we build some, some stuff, and then we need to run it. As I, I've said before, running takes an initial state, and I have this function that represents all the transformation, so all I have to do is pass the initial state into the function, and then get the result out of it. So that's how you run it at the end of the day. However, we don't want to just like create one and run one. We want to compose these things together. And the primary way is with this function called flatmap. And what flatmap is saying is this. Let, imagine you have a program, a state program, that modifies the state, like describes modification of the state, and returns an A. And then I have a way of saying, depending on which A I return, I can produce another program. I want to get the resulting program that sequences these two together. Uh, this can sound complicated, but it's actually just stupid function composition. I need to return a new state, so I call the state constructor. State constructor needs a function, so I'm going to pass a function, which is from S to whatever. Um, and I already have something, which is this, you know, the, the current state. So I just call modify with this state. And what it's going to return is going to return a partial result and the next state. And then, um, if I pass result into F, so result is an A, I pass it into F, I get the new, uh, the new state, um, and then I just pass net state in. So you don't need to understand all the details of the code, but just what's happening is that you're trading these new copies in this chain of function composition. So that's it. So this is how you run a state, and then how you compose state together, but how do you create your initial mini state programs? So it's, it's, a, it's a common pattern. You're gonna have some primitives, which are your basic programs, some ways of, and, and these are the ones that we're gonna talk about in a second, some ways of assembling these primitives into bigger and bigger programs, and that, that's flat map. And then once you're done with this assembly, you run the whole thing. So the first thing is this pure, and pure is just saying I wanna return a result without doing anything to the state. And this is exactly what the function describes. It takes a state, returns the result, which you need to pass in, and then returns the new state unchanged. So I'm not doing anything to, to, the, to the state I'm passed in. And then get is just saying, well, to get something from a state, it means to return a state computation that returns the current state. So I take the state, I don't touch the new state, because I'm just a get, and then the result is just the state itself, because I, I want to return it. And then finally, to set it, I'm going to ignore the previous state and, and, and set the new state to what I'm being passed in. So all I'm saying is that whatever you had before, I'm going to discard it and pass the new state to the rest of the chain of, of transformations. And this is kind of the same as, as mutation, basically. What, what mutation does is that at some point, I'm going to ignore the previous value of something and continue with the, with the new one. And this is exactly the same thing. Uh, anyway, no need to look into the code in, in detail, just the idea of describing these transformations. Um, okay, so an example. Actually, a typical example of this sort of transformation is a video game run loop, where you have a bunch of commands and something happened and then you kind of loop around. So we have a very, very simple example here, which we're going to uh, talk through. It's a very simple thing where you, have a, you can basically damage or heal a character, and there are commands arriving that tell you either you damage it or you heal it, and you want to kind of 
modify the state of the character to respect these commands. So the way I do this is a simple data type. Uh, so a command can either be a damage, and it contains an integer, which is the amount of health you want to subtract, or it can be a heal, which is another integer, and contains the amount of health that you want to add to your character's life. And then I actually want to use the fact that state is composable to build a composite combinator. So a common thing that we want to do is take the previous state and update it. And because state is, is composable, um, so if you haven't seen this this for this is just a syntactic of a flat map. So what it's doing is calling state get flat map, and then keeps doing flat maps. Um, and I'm going to say, well, what, what is it to update? It means that I want to have the first the program that gets, and then I'm going to do flat map on it, and I'm going to have the result, and then I'm going to apply f to the result, so it's going to change it, and then I'm going to set. Um, to the, new, to the new state. And remember, what, what this is doing is not actually changing anything, it's just describing how this needs to be transformed. And bear in mind, this is, again, compositional and composable because I didn't do it from scratch. I didn't have to write the modify function. I just composed existing things, in, which, in, in this case, just primitives, get and set. Uh, and then uh, this health command is going to take one of the commands, which is going to be either a damage or a heal, and then return a computation in a state that modifies an int, this is our health, and then returns unit. I just want to do this and, and don't return any result. So I'm going to do a pattern match on, um, on, the, on the command. This is the same thing as a switch, pretty much. It's going to say, well, it's either going to be a damage or a heal, uh, and then I'm going to return the program. So if it's a damage, the program I want to return is this update thing by subtracting the amount of health. And if it's a heal, I'm going to do the same update, but adding, adding the int. Um, and then I want to do something else. I want to say, well, how do I report this, this, this final state? Again, it's a program that gets the current state and then map, so transform the result with a function from A to B and just put it into a string. Um, and, and those are all the primitives I need. So again, I'm building like slightly bigger programs from the small ones I started with. And then I have this list of commands. Imagine these are user inputs, you know, damage of one, damage of five, and then heal of two. Um, and this again, this is all coming from cats, um, and again, no need to understand all the details. But what this traverse is doing is basically walking over the list and applying um, any transformation as with the state data type to, to all the, to all the uh, things in the list. So in this case, it's going to, and the transformation we're going to do, we're going to first uh, do health, so it's going to change the state, and then we're going to compose it with report, which is going to take the current state. And, and transform it into a string. So again, I'm actually composing, I didn't build this monolithically, I'm actually composing smaller programs to get to the bigger program I want to have. And each of these things you can understand in isolation. I can replace health with, with this, I can replace report with this, with this um, definition and understand exactly what's going on. Um, and then I, I'm done, and then I want to run it with an initial state, which is the initial health. In this case, I'm going to say the initial health is 10. Uh, and, and, and this is the result. It's going to say, well, the current health is 9, because I decreased. And then it's 4, because I keep decreasing. And then it goes back to 6. So what are the nice things about this? So it's all that is pure. You can do the replacement. And it, at the end of the day, it's just going to um, transform into function composition on immutable data types. So there's, there's, there's nothing that breaks referential transparency, uh, transparency there. Second is compositional. This is the point I made several times. I'm just building bigger programs. Um, and finally, it's testable. So let's say I want to try with a different st initial state, like something, something weird, like zero. Or for example, I want to say, well, if I want to test it when the character starts at 45, how do you do it? Well, you just pass a different, a different initial, initial thing there. Because what you want to test is just the, the transformation. Um, and compare with like, with mutable, real mutable state, you have to kind of set up mocks to make, to make things into the initial state that you want to test. So this looks awesome. So then why, why is it not cool for what we need to do? As it turns out, if you have a function and you compose it with another function, that is literally the most sequential thing you can possibly do. You take a result and you pass it to the next thing. So it's literally a pipeline. However, in, in, at least in server-side apps, there are other, other 
kind of scenarios where this makes sense. But in server-side apps, most of it is concurrent. Think about a cache where you have evictions, sorry, <clears throat> things put in the cache and things getting in the cache and it's not sequential. Um, or all sorts of uh, you know, user repositories, which again, are like uh, you might get from, from different threads or fibers or whatever. And also, state can only deal with uh, immutable data types, because it's just staying copy, but some things are inherently already mutable. Like if you get a JDBC connection from a Java library, that's already mutable. You cannot make it non-mutable. Um, so we cannot use state, but can we keep referential transparency? Because at the end of the day, the reason state is nice is because I can assemble things, and the reason I can assemble things is because of referential transparency, or this property of, of replacing and substituting. So, <clears throat> spoiler alert, yes, we can. Uh, and you've already actually seen this, the, 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 the magic type that can do it. Uh, and that's oh yeah, from Cass Effect. Um, so, same thing, it's a data type. I don't, I'm not going to talk about its implementation of another talk on how this works internally, um, but just the semantics. So the semantics that an IO of A is something that will produce one value, or fail, or never terminate. These are the three things that, that it can do. And it's referentially transparent, I showed you at, at the start with that real line, um, and that means that it's pure. So common myth in, that in functional programming you have the pure side and the impure bit, which is IO. No, IO is 100% pure, so there's no no tricks there, it's just that property, and the property is uh, respected. And can suspend any side effect, um, so you just put a chunk of side effect in code, and it's gonna suspend it, so it's not evaluated until the whole I.O. Is, is being composed. And again, this has got many algebras. It's actually got even more algebras than just state, because we have an algebra, so an API for concurrency, for example, with lightweight threading that we implemented, or an algebra to suspend side effects, or an algebra for errors. So it's very, very rich in its compositional uh, qualities. And the key idea is that if you want to do concurrent show state, it happens in I.O. Or actually, um, you can actually abstract over this as well. So this is just for people who already seen Cat's effect, but we have actually um, APIs that describe all the different aspects of what I.O. can do. Um, so you can actually say, well, I don't want to specify I.O., I want to just say something that I, I, at least is capable as some of the things that I.O. can do. But this is not too important. We're going to kind of skip over, skip over this bit. Okay, so how do you design things when you have to deal with, with, with mutable data? So you can either wrap it directly with I.O., I'm going to show you how to do it, or you can use cast effect primitives with immutable data. So as it turns out, for many, many things, a small amount of of primitives can help you build a lot of a lot of things, and we've already put them in cat's effect. But sometimes you're dealing with something that you cannot you cannot uh, represent with those, like JDBC, and then you can you can wrap it directly. And general advice is use the primitives when you can, uh, and only wrap directly when, when you must, because they're already like nicely nicely done for you. So the things like I kind of want to show you both. So both how you wrap it directly and how you use the primitives. So the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to show you how the primitive itself is implemented. Because the primitive is wrapping directly, obviously. And then when you use the primitive, you don't have to do direct wrapping yourself. Um, and, and to wrap, there is a very, very simple recipe. It's a dumb recipe. You don't have to apply any, any, any reasoning. Access, modification, and creation of mutable states, they all have to be wrapped in IO. It's as simple as that. So most people understand very easily why access and modification need to be wrapped. We kind of talked about it, but they get confused with creation. But if you don't put creation in I.O., then you're going to get the same sharing that you have with future, where like when you refer to it twice, it's referring to the same thing, whereas we wanted to keep that, um, that substitution property. Okay, so let's enter the primitive. Uh, this is a ref, it's short for, for reference. It's actually, for, for those of you who know, it's a thin wrapper of uh, atomic reference in, in Java concurrent. Um, so it's a purely functional, concurrent, lock-free, mutable reference. We're not gonna go too much into the why it's lock-free and, and, and all of that, um, but it's a purely functional mutable reference, uh, essentially. Uh, and this is API. So this F here, just imagine it, it's IO. So get is gonna return an IO of A, for, for any A, and set is gonna take an A and return an, an IO of unit. And then you have these interesting functions, update and modify. I'm not gonna go too much into why they're there, 
But just notice that update is not the same thing as not the same thing as get and then set. Because obviously now we're talking about a concurrent capable data structure. If you do get and then set, you're gonna get race conditions with other things. Um, but that's not the important bit uh, in this talk at least. I have again other talks for that. Is this create? So because ref is wrapped in some mutable state, the creation is wrapped in I.O. And so you get this shape, which is typical of F of ref of F and A. So this thing, if you start doing some purely functional programming in Scala, you're gonna see it all over the place. So just get used to, to this pattern. Um, and, and let's see how this is implemented. And again, it's just following the same recipe I gave you. So it's just a class. Um, I have this atomic preference, which is private. I don't want people messing up with their state because otherwise they can break referential transparency. And then every method is just wrapped in I.O. So that the side effect is suspended and doesn't happen as soon as you um, refer to that thing. So this is how update works. For those of you who are curious, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into the detail, but if you know sort of a bit of log-free concurrency, it's just a cast loop on, over an atomic reference. So it's very simple, gets a copy, tries to set the copy, and if there was a conflict, it retries. And this is non-blocking, so there's no, it doesn't block a thread, so it's way faster than, than a mutex or a monitor or whatever uh, blocking primitive you wanna, you wanna use. And then, on create, it's the same thing, but I need to wrap in IO. It's for the same principle. I don't want that atomic preference to be shared freely, I want it to be shared only when I decide to, uh, to do so via substitution. Uh, and that's the version with like, the abstracted thing. I'm just replacing I.O. With, with the type class, but again, not very important. Um, okay, so this is how you kind of wrap it. And again, if you have a JDBC connection or whatever else, same recipe, you don't have to think, wrap every method in I.O. is gonna be pure. But how do you go about using it? So this is actually where things get interesting and why I think your code changes for the better if you use, if you use this approach. So first of all, I have a little trivia. I have a counter, I'm creating this ref. It's a ref of integer, uh, initialized to zero. And again, the type is IO of ref of IO of A. So a program that will create this reference. And then I have again a full comprehension that says, well, take the counter, flood map to get to the ref, and update by adding one to the counter. And then I'm gonna do, again, reference the counter and do get. And then imagine that this is your old program and it's your last instruction in main, you just run it. So this is literally like the final bit of your program. So how many people think that this is gonna return one, this program? It's not a trick question, you can, you can, yeah? Other answers? How many people think that this is not going to return one? Okay, it's one person. Okay, so the good news is that I've already given you all the tools to understand what this does, because as I've told you, the main point of this is that we can apply the substitution model. So I think a lot of people think this is gonna return one and because they're used to side effects. So they see counter counter, it has to be the same thing. That's how side effects work. But let's try and, let's try and apply the substitution model to it. So I have counter there, I'm just gonna replace counter with its definition, just like I replaced x with one in the very first so slide of the talk. And when you do it, you realize that the first line is gonna create the ref and then update it. And the second line is gonna create another ref and then get the, the, the thing from it. So actually this thing is gonna return zero because these two things create two separate refs. So this is one of the most asked questions in all the channels of the libraries I maintain. Like, okay, how the hell do I make it work then? And I get crazy, like, oh, I should memoize the I.O. and all sorts, of, and all sorts of, of crazy, crazy tries. But actually, it's really, really easy to make this work. Same thing, I have a counter. But this time, instead of uh, referencing counter, I'm just gonna pass in the ref. So bear in mind, I'm not passing an IO of ref, I'm passing a ref as an argument. And now I know that when, every time I call C, it's the same ref, right? It's just, it's just a, a piece of data. And then, because I wanna create it once, I call the creating program once, I flood map it, that's the ref, and I pass it in. And now, this is gonna get shared. And again, if you wanna know why this is shared, you can just replace, and you're gonna see that it's gonna be created once and pass, and pass twice. And actually, yeah, I've actually done it in the slide, good. So again, all I've done is apply substitution model 
take a name and replace the definition of, of that name everything, everywhere I see the name. And there you see that it's creating the ref once, passing it as an argument in both places, and, and, and that's it. Okay, so this is, this is the how, that's how you do it. Okay, but why did we introduce this sort of kind of indirection? Uh, is it actually giving us any, any benefits? I think for most people, they think that the second program is correct, and the first program is, is buggy, right? But actually, they're both very useful, because sometimes we want to share some state, and sometimes we want to isolate some state. For example, let's say I have a cache. Imagine that the cache is implemented in terms of ref or any other cuts effect primitive. And I have two programs that take the cache. Imagine it's a cache of users, so you might do some login and caching their credentials or whatever. Now, in some scenarios, you want these two different programs to have separate caches because you, know, you might want to use it for, for, different, for different purposes in the two programs. So the way you do that, you say, well, create cache and pass it to program one, and then create another cache and pass it to program two. And now your two features have separate caches. But in other scenarios, you want the cache to be shared because maybe P1 is the one that is putting things in the cache and P2 is, is getting things from the cache. And so the way you, want, you do that, you just say, well, create the cache once and then take the reference and pass it to both programs. And, note, and, and, and this is how it works, basically. So what you're doing, you're basically creating a region of sharing just by passing arguments. Every time you're passing arguments, you're kind of creating these regions where the, sh the, the, the state can potentially be shared. And every time you flat map, you're basically sealing that region and say, well, in that, in that region, that's where I'm getting a single thing. And then the higher you go in your core graph, the wider the region is. So if you compare this thing here, you have cache and cache. And if you look at the program just below, I just put cache a level above and then pass in the argument uh, in, in both programs. So if you keep going higher and higher and higher, at some point you will create it in main, and that's the equivalent of truly global state. Like your whole application shares the same thing. But with this thing, I actually managed to control exactly what is shared and what is not shared just by passing arguments. So very, very simple technique. Compared with like singletons or any other crazy, crazy approach to doing the same thing. So this is the most important slide on the talk. So the key property is that the regions of state sharing are the same as your call graph. Just look at where the arguments are passed, that's where the state is shared or isolated, which is, it's, and they're both great, great properties. So we have moved a dynamic behavior of which shared what into a very dumb, simple, syntactical property. Which argument is passed to where? We get something that is always understandable by substitution, doesn't matter how complicated your access patterns are, you can always replace it everywhere and get a simple program that tells you everything you need to know. And we avoid spaghetti by controlling sharing and isolation because we want both, depending uh, on, on, on our needs. And we do this just, just by passing arguments, so nothing, nothing fancy. And finally, this is testable by default because to share state, I have to inject it. And because I have to inject it, I can actually inject a mock uh, implementation of, of the state, like a mock ref or a mock cache or whatever. So you get lots of benefits, even if you don't care about functional programming at all, for theoretical reasons, whatever, you don't care about monads and fancy names. This is, this is like real stuff. This is stuff that we have to deal with every day, how to share state, how to control the sharing, how to test stateful things. Okay, so I want to talk very briefly about, about this. Um, this is just a technique uh, for, for abstraction, where we are abstracting over, over a type parameter. Um, and actually, we've already seen an example. It's ref itself. So instead of passing this, this object, um, I'm just saying, well, I represent the API of this object like, like this. We like to call these algebras, because like, they're nice and composable, but whatever. And every method returns a little program. So it looks like a, a Java style interface, but it's very different, because a Java interface here will return unit. And that's not a program. It doesn't respect that property of substitution, so you can't compose it with other things to build bigger programs. It's just a thing. Once you run it, you've lost, you've lost your property. So there's a key, key difference there. Um, and then, instead of using these refs and other primitives directly, what I like to do is I like to build business logic related abstractions that then 
call these things. So if I want to have a counter, I'm not going to, I don't want to deal with, with ref itself, I want to deal with a counter obstruction. So for example, um, the way I will model a counter, I can increment, I can get, and I can reset. And by the way, another interesting thing is that I actually like to do this before implementing it. I start with my semantic domain because I can make it as nice as I want. I can solve any problem because I'm just making things up. Then I implement the calling code and now everything is worked and it's testable. And then I go and implement it. So what happens is that you build in these layers of little languages, each one like simpler than the other until you've decomposed your, prog your program and your problem in chunks that you can, you can deal with. So kind of this multiplies your skill as a programmer, because at some point, no matter how good you are, you're gonna end up with a problem that is too hard to tackle at once. And this gives you a nice little technique for, for dealing with, with this complexity. And then the way I implement this, again, the shape that we talked about, f for counter of f, because counter is, is stateful. It contains obviously the state of, of the counter. I'm gonna create a ref. This, it's a program that returns a ref, so a map to transform the result, which is the ref. And I can create this abstraction. And the implementation is just trivial. Increment is just update on the ref. And then I can get and I can set to zero. And I can use this thing to build programs. So for example, this is a thing that increment the counter once a second. So he has two abstractions. One is timer, which is from cat's effect. The other one is this counter, which I've just built. And it returns this IO. And what it does is leaves for one second, increments the counter, and then recur. So just think of it for one second. Another small interesting thing is that this leaf is actually not blocking a thread. It's non-blocking. So you can have a million of these leaves only on like two or three threads or even one. And I have a talk on fibers that explains how this works under the hood, but it's a bit more kind of complex. But you don't have to think about it. It's just non-blocking. You can run on many, like, like 100,000, a million of these uh, without blocking threads. And actually, when you start exploring the ecosystem, it's full of this. So you learn this pattern once, this simple pattern, which is, funny enough, so simple to understand once you've seen it and so hard to figure out by yourself, this just passing arguments, it's everywhere. So Catafet, Ref, Defer, Semaphore, and VAR, they all have this. We in FS2 have QQ, Signal, and Topic. HP4S client returns that, which always confuses a lot of people why an HTTP client is stateful, but actually we have a connection pool there, so you can decide which calls need to share the same connection pools and which calls have separate connection pools. Again, just for fasting arguments. And then we have a very complex one that translates between FS2 and Reactive Stream with like, like crazy state machine. Um, so it's a very, very common, common abstraction. And you can use it to, be, to build your own as well. So, and finally, I've just shown you with, with IO, but you can have more, you can have a different type. So another very typical example is with resource. So resource is a type that gives you resource safety, gives you the ability to open something and then to close it. So with ref, you don't need to close it, but imagine a socket. Um, so, and because we're representing everything as these regions of sharing, I also get a very simple way of saying close. It's just like at the end of the region. Uh, and so you're gonna see a resource of f of counter or a resource of f of connection. And finally with stream, FS2 stream, you get not only resource safety, but also a very nice, beautiful model of concurrency where every stream is a lightweight thread that you can compose with other streams and do all sorts of things. So if you're interested more in this aspect of design, I have other talks on stream and ref and defer that tell you how to build like actual caches and, and concurrent stuff. Um, so but to recap, so referential transparency rules. Functional probe is not about avoiding side effects. And, and it's not about being you know, morally superior to impure code. It's just about this syntactical property. And concurrent state happens in IO. So the statement is cool. Uh, if you have a use case for it, by all means, use it. But if you do server-side code, and I imagine most people kind of do something similar, you have concurrent state, you have to use IO for that. And also, the key thing is that when you apply the French transparency to statefulness, the regions of sharing are the same as of your call graph. It's a very nice way of controlling isolation and sharing. And finally, build your abstraction on top of these stateful things with Douglas Final. So conclusion, concurrent share of state and effects in general are not a weakness of purity, they're a strength. So common myth is that when you have some simple non-effectual non transformation that you can do map and flood map, but then when you need databases and stuff that you need to go to side effects. I would say it's actually the other way around. If you have a very simple transformation, you can use whiles and bars for performance, like that initial map. That's perfectly fine. But when the hard stuff comes, when you have concurrency 
and an interruption and resource safety. That's what I want functional, functional programming because I like to reason about these things compositionally because they're hard. So that's it. Uh, so I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can reach on, on Gitter at System of Omega. And I have all the slides and all the other talks at my blog. Uh, and thank you very much for your time.